I love it. Good morning, everybody. I had a great countdown going on over here, getting ready for service. Woo-hoo! We hit to the one. We're down to the zero. Welcome, everybody watching online. Those of you outside, welcome. I was glad when they said unto me, finish it with me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Do you guys know that song? Let's say it together. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And that's where we are. Why? That we might meet with our God, that we might be in his presence, and we might do it together as one body, as one family. Do you know you are called the body of Christ? You know that? You are the body of Christ, the representation of Jesus in this world, all of us together who know him are his body. Those of you online, you're joining with us today, so we're gonna lift up our praise, we're gonna lift up our hearts. We want God to meet with us in this house and fill it with his glory. Father, it is you that we have come to worship and to see, to honor and to bow before. God, with our hearts, we lift up our praise. From our hearts, we lift up our songs from our hearts. God, we come in humility. We come to be changed. We come to hear your word. We come to be transformed. We come to meet with you. We come, God, we come boldly with confidence as sons and daughters, owning that you have brought us into your family. And there are some even this morning who might come seeking, wanting to understand who you are. May you reveal yourself to them as the God most high, the great creator, Lord of all. Jesus, would you receive our praise as we honor your name? If you agree with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's worship today.
lift up an offering of praise right now. Lord, your grace is enough. It sustains me today. Let it be all I need, God. Your goodness, your grace. I was buried beneath my rebellion. Lost without hope of redemption. Blind to my need for a savior. Oh, but God. Crushed by the weight of my failure. And living the lie I created. Digging my grave. Let's just marinate in that moment. All the wreckage of my choices. Oh, but God. Oh, but God. And the Spirit led me this morning to take us in a, 
kind of a different direction. And it was interesting because when I was talking with him this morning, I was saying, this, you know, this is going to be the moment or whatever. And he said, no, this will be a moment, but the whole morning is a moment. So I'm going to be reading Psalm 34. And the Lord spoke to me and said, there's going to be something in it. There's going to be verses for each and every one of us from this as I read it. And so I'd invite you to, if you can, just to close your eyes. And I'm going to speak out this whole psalm. And I pray that the Holy Spirit just ping something to you, to your soul. You're going to know it. He's going to say something in this, in this scripture reading. And it's going to hit your soul. You're going to say, that's for me. That's for me. And then once I'm finished, I just want us to just linger in the presence of God. And then we'll lift our voices once again in praise. But would you close your eyes as I read that song? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So fear the Lord, you saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous and his ears towards their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. And when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all of them. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of them who take refuge in him will be condemned. Ponder with the Spirit today. Redeem me from the pit. But even in it, I'll sing praises. My praises won't relent. For your love, it never fails. Jesus is mine. He's been the fourth man in the fire, time after time. 
focus on Him. I trust in God. I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Make that choice anew today. Lord, you declare that we seek and we will find you. Draw near to you and you draw near to us. When we seek the Lord, you answer. We trust you, you're a living God, a living and vibrant relationship daily. We hear from your spirit and we move. We hear from your spirit and we're corrected. We hear from your spirit, we rejoice. We mourn with those who need to be mourned with. Lord, you teach us the ways of righteousness. We trust in you today, Lord. We say it together as a church family. We trust in you. You will direct our path. You will guide our steps, Jesus. With one heart, we just affirm that together. We love you, Lord. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I'd invite you to be seated as I invite Pastor Ryan up. Hey, let me invite everybody involved, volunteering, leading VBS to come up here right now. Don't get too comfortable. Come up here. As we prepare for this week, you can take the steps, you can take the front, you can take the stage, you can just wherever you can get. If you're helping, you're volunteering with VBS this week, we want you up here on the stage. Oh, yeah. Come on, let's give him a hand. We got an army coming. Come on. So we just received back our team. You guys, come a little forward. Like, come on. You can even take the stairs so people can see you. I don't want you to be hidden, hiding. So we just sent a team to Chiapas, Mexico, and they just came back. They were on mission in Chiapas. Today, we commissioned sending a team right here. They're entering into a week-long mission, so to speak, loving our kids from our community. They'll be kids from our church, kids from our school community, kids from our neighborhoods, kids from all around that will be coming here. They're going to hear about the Lord. They're going to experience the presence of God. They're going to experience people who love them. We're going to tell them the truth about their identity. Come on now. How many of you know they need to hear that? And for these five days, they're going to get poured into. They're going to get loved. They're going to be cared about. They're going to do things with their hands that they're proud of. They're going to learn skills that, that make them feel like a million bucks. But it's these leaders and many others who are just saying, God, we're going to give of our time. But would you help me? Help me be you. Help me be Jesus so these kids experience you. And that's what we get to stand together as a church family. Amen? We're a body in this. And so as they step into this, we're going to commission them. So would you extend your hands toward them? In fact, I'll ask you to stand too, if you can stand. Extend your hands toward this team as they go about this week. Father, we recognize, we recognize the call to shine bright for you. God, we recognize the opportunity to declare truth. We recognize the responsibility to build these bridges of relationship that draw the souls of parents and children out to recognize that they're in a safe place to be loved, to be known, to be cared about. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move powerfully in our midst. 
God, we pray for signs and wonders that you would heal those who need healing. We pray for words, prophetic words to be shared of identity and calling over these kids. God, we pray for divine appointments to be made here in the sanctuary and out on the plaza with parents coming and picking up, that there would be hope for those that need hope in the city, that there would be truth for those that need to hear truth and an unwinding of lies in their life. God, that there would be transformation for hearts that need the touch of God on them. God, that this house would be called your house, full of joy, full of celebration, full of life, but be your house a place where people in this community know that they can go to meet with the living God. May all of those things be accomplished. We pray for energy and strength and anointing upon them, grace, strength that they don't have, abilities that are beyond their own, to be your hands and feet, to be your mouthpiece. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we tell them we love you guys? You are released into that. It's going to be an awesome week. Give them a hug as they go. Greet the people around you, and we'll come back in just a minute. As we make our way back to our seats, I love seeing all the green t-shirts. Excited to see a lot more uh, tomorrow evening. Bye, high school. They like to stay around and just talk. Bye, high school. Get out of here. Just kidding. We love our high schoolers. We love them. We love them. Well, good morning. My name is Lexi. Welcome. If no one told you today, we are so excited that you are here and to decided to join us this morning. So welcome. If it's, if it's your first time here, just want to send an extended thank you for joining us and welcome to the Bridge family. We're so excited 
that you decided to join us this morning. If it is your first time here or maybe you're newer to the bridge, we um, would love to get to know a little bit more about you, your story, and just what makes you, you. And we would love if you could fill out a connection card um, right outside here. Sydney's usually out there. She's awesome. And you'll get a Starbucks gift card from us. So if you uh, were on the fence, maybe that'll get a little, a little kick start. Maybe some coffee this week during VBS might be a good idea. Um, and yeah, so welcome. Uh, our first um, highlight is we have a Paint for Kenya Families. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this really quickly. So in a couple months, I'm not exactly sure when, we are sending a team to Nairobi, Kenya. And they're going to be doing some great things there. They'll be in the slums. So with people who live in impoverished areas. And um, I guess a team went out over 10 years ago and did paintings for them with scripture on them. And we found out that the people who received those still have them 10 years later. And they cherish them and they something like a prized possession to them. And so we as a church family wanted to go ahead and do that all together. And last week's sermon, Ryan, um, it's really been sitting with me, I've actually been wrestling with this all week, said, nobody should love people better than the church. And this is a great way to be the tangible hands and feet of Jesus. And I've been praying all week, God, what does that look like for me? What does what does loving people to the best of my um, abilities look like? As a broke college student, I'm not exactly sure if I can give funds, if I could, if I could be like, here. But I, the Lord's been telling me, you can give your time. You can go and you can give your time to others. You can love people in that way. And so this is a great way for families too to bring your kids, to show people that as the church, we love people to the best of our abilities. And so we wanted to send our team with beautiful paintings with scripture for um, these men and women and children in Nairobi, Kenya, in the slums to have something to hold on to, um, to have them as a reminder that they are loved by God. And so that is going to be June 29th in the lower campus. There's more information on um, the church website, thebridgerrsm.info, I believe. Yes. <laughs> um, if you would like to sign up. And then the last thing I have is we have an angels game coming up for our men's ministry, or is sponsoring an event for the whole family, excuse me. Our men's ministry is for the whole family and angels game. So invite everybody, invite your neighbors and your friends. Um, the tickets are first come, first serve. So if this is something you know your family is going to really want to do or you have friends that might really want to come, definitely snag those tickets. I know I'm not a huge baseball fan, but it's always fun to go to a game, get a hot dog or something, hang out with friends. I'm like, what's going on during the game? I don't know. I'm talking to people the whole time. I have no idea. I don't, maybe my attention spans that long, I don't know, but it's fun to go, right, a summer activity, if you will, so go snag your tickets if you're interested, and if you're baseball fans, then definitely do, so um, yeah, and if you would just join me, I feel like it's hard to come up here and not recognize all the amazingness our team did, every year they talk, I know, can we give them a round of a hand, like, or a, yeah, they, every year they talk about what they're going to do, and every year in my head, I'm like, I don't know how that's going to work out. And every year I'm just blown away by the amazing, um, the amazing stuff our team puts together. So if you would just join me in praying for tithe and offering. And if you could just see what tithe and offering, where it, where it goes to as we offer um, Mega Skills Camp, a free event for our community. That this is where, um, this is where a lot of, not a lot, but this is where we can see our tithe and offering put into place as we extend our hands to our community and welcome everybody in. So, and there's still time to sign up. So if you have something on your heart that's, that's uh, pulling at, at your heart to sign up, there's still time. There's still time. Okay, will you join me in praying over our tithe and offering? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for, for getting to be together as a family, all together on Sunday, God. 
I just thank you so much for what you're going to do this upcoming week, Heavenly Father. There is so much um, that's already in store as you prepare the hearts of kids, of families, of leaders, Heavenly Father. And I just pray a blessing over, over the willingness to give. God, of, um, of our resources to your kingdom, as we can see it put into place for our community, Heavenly Father, um, I just pray a special blessing over today's tithe and offering, Heavenly Father, that um, we can just see it um, move in powerful ways, God. I just also pray for this upcoming week um, as we dive into mega skills, God, that you just prepare this room, you prepare this place as a safe place, God, where your spirit dwells, Heavenly Father, that this space is um, feels different for people when they walk in, um, when there's kids worshiping and jumping and just the excitement that comes with your love and, the, um, and just the uh, the knowledge of knowing that you sent your son for every kid that's going to come here, God, that you know them by name, God. We just pray over, over this week just a covering of protection and over all of our volunteers too, Heavenly Father. We just pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. We get the opportunity to conclude this series. I say opportunity because next week will be a special time of coming together at the end of VBS and, and uh, just not only celebrating what God's doing, hearing the stories and the testimonies, but um, getting to probably welcome other people that we haven't seen from our community to and get to uh, uh, embrace them as we wrap up the week. But this wraps up our series, Fearless Trust, um, and uh, this particular part, Fearless Promisers, we talk about moving into the promised land. At the beginning of the year, we said this year, if we could focus on one thing, it was the word fearless, fearless. What would it be like if we spent the entire year not making decisions in fear? What if we did not allow fear to motivate, to dictate, to shrink our lives in any way. But in anything and everything that could eat our lunch and produce fear, anxiety, we would take those things to the Lord and say, God, I'm learning, I can trust you with this. In particular, finances, the season, the cultural time in which we live, it's on our minds. Finances is one of the biggest areas. Provision, providing for my family, providing for my future, providing for our, our home, our, our needs, all of that. And that has been the, the main focus of this series as we talk about how God was with Abraham, reminding him, I'm with you, I'm calling you out. And we talked about the story of grace as seen through Abraham's life, all of which had this picture, you were blessed to be a blessing. My intention for you is to bless your life is to overflow, because your life is intended to bless the people around you. And from that lens, we talked about then God leading them through a season in the wilderness, a season of testing, trials, a season of daily dependence on him, and the, the ways in which he taught them and brought them close and said, you're gonna have to trust me every day. For 40 years, he fed them every day. For 40 years, he protected them for 40 years. He was with them, their clothes didn't wear out, their sandals didn't wear out, it's amazing. But he said, this is what you can trust me even in seasons when you don't have abundance, to be your enough, to be your abundant. I will bring, I'll be there every morning when you wake up. Some of you are in season like that. But for the most of us, the, the reality of where we're at today, especially living in our, in our country, is that we're in this other season the season where now you're moving into the promised land. And as they moved into the promised land, the promise was this is going to be a land where there is abundance, where you're not gonna worry about whether or not your shoes are gonna wear out, you're gonna have another pair of shoes, 
where there is going to be food in abundance and bread in abundance. But the challenge of a season like that, it's different than the one before. Challenge in this season is that your heart forgets their dependency on me. That there's going to be a tendency, we read in Deuteronomy, for your heart to become proud, to be lifted up, it says, and forget God. And Moses keeps reminding this word forget. Don't forget, you have to remember. Don't forget, you have to remember. But it's easy to forget when we're not in desperate situations. Are you with me? Until a desperate situation comes along again and we go, oh God, I need you. And he says, you always need me. But let me develop for you now in the promised land rhythms. And we talked about first the rhythms of how to continue giving with joy. The only kind of giving I'm inviting you into are rhythms of giving with joy. And he spoke about tithes and first fruits and bringing those and what we say when we do, what they represent, what they remind us of. And then he talked about, and we talked last week about this system or these, these, this understanding of living lives of generosity, he actually built it into the economy that we would have a heart for and a concept of the poor. How do we care for the poor and the marginalized in society? We're not gonna glean our fields to the edges. We're going to make sure they have a voice in representation that everything we do is going to be done with an eye to caring for the poor and those who are marginalized, and that's what Lexi was mentioning earlier. This week, we wrap it up, and we talk about one more rhythm, and it's a powerful one, and probably it's gonna come across, I'm guessing you're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit more machine gun. I have points, but I think for our hearts, it's gonna come across a little more machine gun in that there are gonna be certain things that hit you differently than other people in this whole concept of gathering with gratitude or gladness or gathering. He set up systems or rhythms that every year at certain times they would assemble as a whole people. Not only every seven times a year, but also every week. And Moses goes through, and I'm gonna read this whole passage to you out of Leviticus 23, so you see the whole context this is before they're in the land. They haven't got there yet. And he says, when you get there, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pick a place, a special place, where I'm gonna dwell. And that's eventually, we know that was Jerusalem. When the temple was built in Jerusalem. And it's gonna be a spot for gathering. But also, you're gonna gather in your towns. And here, you're gonna gather. And I'm calling these holy convocations. Now, that's not a word we use very often. Um, but holy gatherings, we're talking about what is a holy convocation. And he says, these are times, weekly and yearly, where I'm calling all my people to assemble, either where you are in the towns you live or to a place, a particular spot, three times a year, here in Jerusalem. Now, why are they holy? Well, he'll say, these are mine, these are my feasts, these are my gathering days. They're holy because they're special to me, they're not like any other day, they're not common. On these days, we don't do what we normally do, we do something totally different. On these days, like a Sabbath day, we don't work. They're actually built in holidays. They're built in rest and celebration days. And they're not to be treated commonly, and they're not to be ignored. They're holy, and they're convocations. They are gatherings. They are assembly. They are us coming together in a place. That's how important they are to me. And so that's what he's going to say. And so he gives the list of what these holy convocations are. I won't have time, and some of you will be disappointed, to explain all of the feasts and what they represent because each one is powerful in itself to explain. We won't have time for that. We're mostly going to focus on why. Why would God build this rhythm into the ethos of the people? Why would he prioritize us gathering weekly and specially certain times of the year? Why is it such a big deal to God? Well, go back to the danger and the challenge of the promised land. 
It's forgetting. It's becoming arrogant and proud in our resource. It's turning our heart away from the Lord to chase after other gods. So how does gathering together affect that? How does it, when we're here this, this morning, how is that change or affect that? That's what we're going to look at. So let me read this whole passage. I'll, I'll hit parts of it as we go, and then we'll just look at a few questions so that we're processing the why. Why is this so important? Why does this matter to God? Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. So Moses, this is what I want you to tell the people. This is what I want you to explain to them. These are holy gatherings. These are gatherings that are special to me. They're coming from me. I'm saying this to the people as they go into the land. This is something to always remember. He begins, though, not with feasts, but with the remembrance of the Sabbath, something we talked about in the wilderness that was established in the wilderness. He's saying this is going to carry on into the promised land. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation, a special time of assembly as my people. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So Sabbath continues from the wilderness now into the promised land. They're supposed to take that day and make it special, holy, and gather together before the Lord. Now here are the seven feasts. They're gonna be broken up if you're trying to figure out the timing of the years. There's four that are roughly starting in March, April, that will end in June. So they're in like the springtime of the year, and there are three in the fall time of the year, and they both have special representation. But the first four, let's read through these, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These are appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You're going to gather together. You shall do no ordinary work, but you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. I'll stop there just for a quick explanation. So we're talking about Passover. If some of you remember Passover, it relates to and speaks back to Israel leaving Egypt when the angel passed over. It was the 10th plague, the final plague in Egypt, and he said, all the firstborn are going to uh, be killed unless you shed the blood of the lamb and you on the doorposts and on the sides, on the lintel and on the post, in the, really in the form of a cross. But they were to do that with the blood of the lamb, protect, and the angel passed over. But for Egypt, that was the final plague, and they just sent them out after that, the Passover. Jesus, of course, fulfilled this as our Passover lamb who was killed, and on the cross, the form of the cross, he was killed on Passover. He fulfilled this specifically in his life. But Passover, followed by an assembly, a time to gather together, seven days we're gonna feast. I don't have time to get into all the things that happened in those seven days, but for seven days, imagine that, a seven-day party, a seven-day feast. And this was one of the three that they were required to go to, the males, all the males in Israel every year, all the way up to Jerusalem, from wherever they were, they would gather in Jerusalem. For seven days, they would feast, they would celebrate, they would come before the Lord. It's a powerful picture. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, and, on, and speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, and reap its harvest, 
You shall bring of the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the, the priest shall wave it, and on the, on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine, fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord, with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin, and you shall eat neither bread nor grain, nor parched uh, or fresh until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your, of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. In this particular feast, the Feast of First Fruits, it was the first harvest, so this is the grain harvest, so there's two, you'll see first fruits in here, there's wheat and there's barley. There's two different harvests that would come. In this particular harvest, they would take a sheaf of it and they would come, it would be a holy day, special day, they would assemble really in their areas now before the priest and the priest would wave it and they were not allowed to eat of this first fruits of this harvest, they were not allowed to eat of it until they had first brought it to the Lord. And they would bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, you, you, you've done this, you did this, this belongs to you, you first. That was another time of gathering. Then we had the Feast of Weeks, which is also Pentecost. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, so you see how these are all connected. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. It's the second first fruits offering. And you shall present the bread with seven lambs a year old without blemish, one bull from the herd and two rams, and they shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings and food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as sacrifices of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall do not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap it right to, to its edges. This is what we talked about last week. Nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor, for the sojourner. I am the Lord, your God. Pentecost. Powerful time. Uh, by the way, Jesus was uh, crucified on Passover and he was raised three days later as the first fruits. The Bible calls him the first fruits of those who experienced resurrection. This particular one is now 50 days later, Pentecost. It is the second of the three where they would gather in Jerusalem specifically. That's why on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, you have people coming from all over the known world, both uh, Jews and those who uh, were proselytes to Judaism came from all over. They came as far as Rome was the farthest of them. They were coming from the east. They were coming from the west, the north and the south, and they were all gathering in Jerusalem. And we know on this day the fulfillment of the coming of the Holy Spirit being poured out, the church being birthed, the church being birthed. It's a picture and a remembrance for, for, for Israel of them being gathered together before Mount Sinai as a people. Those two loaves representing the, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, being waved before the Lord. So this was another first fruits offering that was taking place. It had a powerful fulfillment already, but they would gather together with all these other sacrifices that they would bring, all of them have tons of meaning and don't have time to get into it. And then there was one more. Oh, no, that was the fourth. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. 
a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation you shall not do, any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. So now we've moved into the fall, the final three feasts in the fall, this one in particular, if it keeps that fulfillment of these, like the prophetic point, reason for these feasts, if it carries like it did in the first four, this is most likely the day the church is raptured. You have the trumpet being blown, which is spoken of in the New Testament, uh, the trumpet of God, the church being gathered to him uh, in the air. At this moment, many believe this is possibly going to be fulfilled on the day. We don't know the time, the hour. It's weird to even say something like that. Um, we'll just leave that one really loose. But it's very possible that when the church and when the rapture occurs during this very feast, could be on that day like the other have all been to the day. These feasts have a lot of meaning. The second uh, feast in the, in, the, in the fall, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Some know Yom Kippur. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You're gonna gather again. This one's different though. This is the first and only one that doesn't have a whole lot of feasting, celebrating going on. In fact, it's got a very different tone. It's a tone of repentance. It says, you shall, shall be a holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, and you shall not do any work on that day. It is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people, and whoever does, not, whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It shall be for you a Sabbath of solemn rest. You shall afflict yourselves. It means fast, not be comfortable. Some would put on garments of mourning, the whole point was a heart posture of, this is not a celebration, this is also a recognition of uh, the, what, was, what is needed to cover my own sins. This particular day is probably the day spoken of uh, by Zechariah and other prophets, the day when Israel as a nation recognizes Jesus finally. Their eyes are open to him whom they have pierced and this great revival takes place in Israel. But at that day is spoken of by Zechariah as a day of tremendous mourning, tremendous uh, grief in the sense of, um, God, you did this for me. And I didn't know. I didn't know you. We didn't recognize you when you came. Solemn day of that. And then the final is the Feast of Booths. And the Lord said to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel, saying, on the 15th day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, a gathering, everybody coming together. This is the third, where all the males were required to gather in Jerusalem. Everybody, hundreds of thousands into the millions of people would be coming to Jerusalem together to assemble. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do not do any ordinary work. Now these are the appointed feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim as times of holy Convocation. I don't know if you were counting how many times I read the word words holy convocation, but they happened a lot, right? Because it's such a weird word you hear it every time I read it. Convocation. We don't even use it. But holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides the Lord's Sabbaths. And besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. It's interesting to read that 
at least for me, as I'm going through this and I'm looking at all the things that are going on in these particular days at these feasts, all of the offerings, everything that's being said, everything that is an offering represents something that's being said by the heart of the offerer, something that's being recognized, but all of it is pointing to God, all of these things. Everything, he's the focus. Everything is pointing to him, to his holiness, to his righteousness, to his majesty, to him being the source. Everything's pointing to him. He says, besides all the other ways in which you come before the presence of God to present or to say or to speak something to God, you bring these things. These are holy convocations. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days. This is another week-long celebration and feast. On the first day shall be a day of solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the first uh, of the fruit of the splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, willows and, and of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord. Say rejoice, just say it with me. Rejoice, rejoice before the Lord, because you can't miss the tone. It's easy to miss the tone of what's going on. You shall celebrate it as a feast for the, to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in the booths for seven days. So what does it mean to dwell in booths? It's remembering their time in the wilderness. Literally, it's a camp out. You remember when you would get with the, make a little Little, uh, we would do this, my, my sister and I all the time, we would take blankets and we'd put them over chairs and we'd sleep under the blankets. It was like we made our little tent. They would do that, but they would do it outside under the stars to remember they're wandering through the wilderness. But this particular feast, its final fulfillment, we read, it continues on into the millennial reign of Christ. After Christ comes back, and rules and reigns again out of Jerusalem. It says this feast, it's the only one mentioned there, Zechariah 14, this feast, all of the nations of the earth will come and they'll present themselves to the Lord there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. And so its fulfillment is actually the millennial reign of Christ. And it speaks about the in-between, wilderness to the promised land. We weren't quite there yet. It reminds us, as it reminds Israel, that the fulfillment is yet to come, that the greatest spot, the place where we're going to be dwelling with God, the place where he comes and reigns, that fulfillment is still in the future. And so, anyway, there's more to say about that. But let me just stop for a minute. It's a lot of words. I read you a ton of scripture. But I wanted you to hear the whole, because if you don't catch it, you think this is just some little thing that means something to God. This means something significant to the Lord. It matters to him greatly that we assemble as his people before him. Now, what is all of the significance of that, and why does it matter? I think there's a lot of answers. I think if I look down each one of these roads that I started trying to study, that they're all rabbit holes of amazing truths. So they're full. That's what I mean by shotgun. You've got it. Lord, what are you saying to me? How do I view assembling before you? Is it a value of mine? Do I, I don't know. How do you see it? Because partly it's, is it a value do you, just to come together, to be with the people of God? Like, this matters to me or it doesn't matter to me. Why does it matter to me? Partly it's that. The other part is, who am I assembling to? I mean, so much of their focus was going up to meet with God. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to see him. And the kids would be excited, and they'd gather, and they'd come as families. They would come, the men. It would be a giant caravan. It would take days and days just to get there to start the celebrations. I mean, just catch the picture. There was no planes. There was no trains, no automobiles. 
There was horseback, camelback, donkeyback walking on your feet. And they're gathering from hundreds of miles away. They're gathering from great distances to this place. And all the way that they're gathering, all the way that they're going, they're, why are we going? What is this for? Who are we going with? It matters to God. I believe a few things. I think they assemble to remember and to recalibrate. There's something in there for us. When we gather on Sundays, when we gather at Christmas time, when we gather in the park at, at Easter, Resurrection Sunday, there is something significant to these moments. When our youth gather on the mountaintop at camp every year, when we gather, there's something significant that happens in that whole remember, remember, don't forget. Remembering our identity, our corporate identity, a shared identity, that these people in the room with you here, they're not common. They're not insignificant. Socially, we may be in different circles outside of this place, but I tell you what, when you come and you are part of the body of Christ, all social divides disappear because we have one who brings us all together. There's one name that names us all, and we're the body of Christ, and we are not just as an identity. Yay, we're the body of Christ. We are. We have a purpose as the body of Christ. It's us. Old and young, every age we have a part to play. Look at all the different colors and ages that are just represented in the shirts that were on the stage. There's an identity that's restored. Remember who you are. You are the people of God, the holy people of God. You are Israel. You have a history, you have a story, and you have a purpose. That's got to be part of it in this recalibrating of the heart for sure. Because they come together, they assemble, they're united, but there's a recalibrating. Imagine you are coming to meet with God, the conversations you're having in your own heart before I come into God's presence. How are we doing? Okay, what's going on? Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Mount Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This was from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 in your Bible. These are all psalms or songs that were sung as they would go up to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was on the mountaintop, the mountain of Moriah, or the mountains of Moriah. In that place, they would go up to it. In some way, you're going up to Jerusalem. But as they went up to Jerusalem, they would sing songs together as a people. This was one of the songs they would sing. How good and pleasant it is when brothers, sisters gather together in unity. It's a beautiful picture. It's like the picture of the anointing oil flowing from Aaron's top of his head down his beard to his robes. Who was Aaron? He was the high priest, the first high priest, the one who represented us in the presence of God. Because we recognize we're going into the presence of God. It's like that, and it's like Mount Hermon, from where all the snow falls and all of the rain falls and all of that flows the water through our land creates the Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee. It's all fed. All the springs are fed from Mount Hermon. It's the beginning, the top part, where all of the source of life flows. Now, that's a picture. I don't know every part of this. I can't even begin. I feel like I barely scratched the surface, and I've been looking at this all stinking week. There's so much here, but what picture do you have when you're getting ready on Sunday morning? 
Like, what's in your mind? Like, I'm gathering to go. We're going to be united. There's assembly. We're the people of God to worship God, represent that there's a flow of life that's expected to flow from these times. And he says, that's good, and that's pleasant, and that's awesome, because something amazing, God commands a blessing in that space. I don't know if you came in expecting the blessing of God commanded here, but that's what happens when our hearts are unified like that. It's so, so special and significant. In what manner would they gather? Well, with joy and with reverence. That's all through this celebrating, rejoicing, singing. They were shouting so they had the trumpets, like we've got our band up here. They had stringed instruments. In the temple, they had, uh, they had people singing response to each other. Everybody was in unison. That's why we don't have the random tambourine person in the church, because it's not part of the band, so please don't bring it. <laughs> because they played together. They sang together. It wasn't even about their individual worship moment. It was about the collective experience before God. But they came with joy. Hearts full of joy, and they came with reverence. And that is probably a huge heart calibrating thing for every one of us. Like the fear of the Lord, the awe and the reverence of God. How much of it captures your heart today? I don't want to mess with you, God. I love you, I respect you. You're God. Like you created, but you blew, you. Life in my lungs, the breath, every part of it comes from you. You're sustaining the entire universe with a word. And when the time comes, with a word, everything that is material in creation is going to dissolve and disappear. That is the power of our God that we're coming before. And they would come with reverence. They were honest about their stuff. They would have to wash their hands and they would come into his presence with this awareness. I'm coming before a holy God. The fear of the Lord was a huge part of this gathering. They would wash their hands. David says this, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? What a big deal it is to do this, he says. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, who does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. Such is the generation of those who seek his face. Because of the blood of Christ, you're not only forgiven, but you've also been given a standing that's amazing. That you can come into God's presence with boldness. But our approach in the boldness and the covering of Christ that says I'm accepted covenantally forever, he's my father and he loves me, should not replace the fear of the Lord that says, but I will not try to hide or cover or pretend that I'm okay when I'm not okay. That I'm living a life that honors you when I'm not living a life that honors you. You still see me. And all through the gospel of grace in the New Testament, Paul still weaves in there, take your salvation serious. Don't give room to live a lifestyle of sin or to accept it as normal. He's a holy God and we're his holy people and we've been called to something more. Are you with me? And they would see that coming as they come in, washing their hands at the labors and, and coming in to his presence. And what was the effect of their assembly? Well, the blessing of the Lord and the renewal of their calling. They would go out under his blessing. They said, come in one way and go out a different way because I don't want you to be the same as you go. When you come into the presence of God, you'll enter through this gate, but I want you to go out through that gate. If you come in that gate, I want you to go out through this gate. 
Why? Because you're being changed. You're coming, you're going to receive the blessing of the Lord. And they would go home knowing, God, you have promised by covenant. As I come and I recognize who I am to you and who you are to me, that you will be my provision, my provider, the one in whom I can trust. Bless my family, bless the field, bless the fruit of my hands. All these things, you're my covering, you're my care. So imagine seasons when there was famine or drought, seasons when there were raiders coming in and, and, and terrorism coming from the sides. They would go before the Lord, say, what's going on, Lord? What's going on? And he would be able to say, come back, you forgot me. You're chasing after the gods of the land. You're chasing after the pursuits of the world. Don't forget me. And he says, anytime you want to seek me like that, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. Would you stand? It's a special thing to be a part of the body of Christ. It's a special thing to have pastors in your life. It's a special thing to be able to give of yourself to be a part of something. All these things, if you read the New Testament, when it talks about who we are now as the church, the body of Christ, it speaks about gifts that somebody has that other people don't have. Gifts of grace that won't be given unless somebody gives them, that nobody has the corner on everything that we need. We actually need each other. It says actually in the body of Christ, there's no room to say I don't need you and no room to say I don't belong. The body of Christ says each part of the body matters. Ephesians 4 tells us that Jesus gave gifts of leadership to the church to help to care for our families, to watch over pastors and teachers and, sh and, and, and apostles and prophets and evangelists to build up the body of Christ so that it matures into who we were created to be. These are the kinds of things that our culture of individualism fights against. It fights against it. It fights against this reality of this collective identity. It fights against other church denominations that are different and like divide, I'm better than you. It fights against this idea that I actually need people in my life. It fights against this image or this picture that, man, I can just love Jesus on my own. I don't need a church. I don't need to hassle with people. I mean... I don't know, sometimes it seems easier, but, but you have gifts that are to be used. God has given you grace. Even this morning, there's someone in this room that actually has a word of encouragement for somebody who needs it. And you don't even know until you start asking, Lord, is there somebody you want me to pray with? Someone you want me to connect with? And probably the biggest thing we face that we're challenged is, and I can't solve it, I don't have a solve, is time. Every one of these holy convocations, they had time. We're in, out, hour and 25, hour and a half, like in and out. We got service on top of service, and we got to turn it all over. We got time frames online and trying to hit podcast times that work. You got all these other weird things and we've got other things planned today. Some of you are leaving here running to something else. It's just different. All I know is he wanted them to have time together and not feel rushed in his presence or with each other so that the ministry, so that the life and the joy that these things could happen. 
So when we gather, as we gather, how we gather, our manner of heart, all these things, it's like, Lord, would you just level up our hearts in these things? Level up our expectation. Level up our sense of dependency. Level up our identity in you. Amen? These songs are a way just for us to respond in that dependency. But let me ask you as we go into them, just what is it that the Lord is trying to communicate to you this morning? What part of this did you need to hear? And God, what do you want me to do with that? What change? Just let him speak that to you before you join in to worship. And then just join in wherever we're at. Sound good? Let's do it.
Blood, Jesus, and stand faultless. Gather before your throne. Bless your name. Come as we are. The sun comes up. It's a new day's on. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's sing your rich and love. in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing and thousand our praises today and your heart to his lifted up in praise you know there's been so many moments for me I want to close in a final song but there's so many moments where man I just I just need to be fed you know you've heard that I come to church to get fed and it's interesting that in those hungry times where I'm desperate to be fed, it's actually kind of a posture where you find yourself actually giving out and, and feeding others. And like we have times of prayer where you can come up and, and be prayed over. We have prayer teams that do that. But the Lord, like Pastor Ryan said, can speak prophetic words to your heart to give to others all the time all over this place. It can happen here. It can happen out at lunch, right? But when we gather together, I, I just pray you just have a sense that Yes, the Lord is going to fill me with his spirit. But I'm coming to be available as well. I'm coming to be used by the Lord. And trust me, I know those times it feels risky at times to share something. Hey, I, I, I feel like the Lord's, I'm just 
take that step of faith because you never know that person that day just needed so badly to hear from the Lord. And he chose you. He chose you to be his voice to their heart. And so let's be the voice to the heart of everyone gathered in this holy convocation, <laughs> right, to sing and end with these words, with this song, as we go and we leave this gate changed. I exalt thee. I as we do that, Lord, your presence is so welcome and your power moves mightily through our lives. Lord, we surrender to that. We surrender that to this week, Lord, and giving of our hearts to those kids at Mega Skills, Lord. May we be poured out an offering, Lord, to their benefit, to your glory. We love you, Jesus. You changed us today. Do you agree with that? Would you say amen? Amen. God bless you. We got a big week ahead of us. Be in prayer. Go out, change today, and change the world in Jesus' name.